All right, as more folks are joining, again, good morning, good afternoon, or evening to everybody with us today. On behalf of USAID and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our theme month webinar on sustainable food systems, building resilience together. I am Catherine Doyle with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the Zoom platform. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you are joining us from. To ask questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Towards the end of today's presentation, we will have time for a Q&A portion where our speakers will answer some of the questions you have asked in the Q&A chat. We are recording this webinar and we will share the post-event resources after the event. And you will also be able to find the resources on agrilinks.org when they are ready. Now I will hand it over to Emily Weeks, Senior Policy Advisor in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Thank you, Catherine, and welcome everybody. It really is a delight to see so many people joining us. I've been watching the numbers very excitedly, seeing them going up and up as far as the number of participants we have. This indicates to us how important this topic is. We've been running this webinar for the last four years on sustainable food systems and having a sustainable food systems month to highlight the importance of addressing our food security issues in a collaborative and integrated way. In particular, bringing together sectors, looking across issues, climate, natural resource management, uh, agricultural practices, market systems, food systems as a whole, and bringing across players that make important decisions and play important roles in improving the sustainability of our food systems, including policymakers, academics, private sector. Today, we are faced with a food crisis as recently reported in the Global Food Report in 2024 that paints a picture of 281 million people experiencing acute food insecurity with 36 countries experiencing protracted multi-year food crisis. As we continue to address the challenges of unpredicted stresses and shocks and ongoing impacts of climate change, including changes in market systems and insecurity in regards to political situations. We continue to need to work together in order to address this challenge. I've been very privileged to be part of this working group that we established about five, six years ago to bring together our colleagues at USAID across our different bureaus and offices to address sustainable food systems and identifying programs and opportunities for us to work with partners to be able to address these challenges collectively. We know that the ongoing rates of deforestation, land degradation, expansion of agriculture, increase in uh, climate impacts and climate shocks, changes in market systems have continued to be a challenge that we at USAID have been working to address and be able to come up with collective solutions to be able to ensure that we can reduce the number of food insecure populations around the globe. I'd like to thank our colleagues here today from across sectors, from our policy teams, from our private sector, from our academic research institutes who are able to participate in contributing to the dialogue on what the solutions are for addressing food insecurity and creating a sustainable food systems platform. I'd also like to welcome Kahir Danani for creating an opportunity of looking at what options there are to be able to increase the investments in sustainable food systems across the investment types, including public and private sector investments. Kahir has been working with USAID in partnership across different projects, supporting us in addressing food loss and waste, su supporting uh, identifying opportunities for investments and resilience, and also looking more broadly at integrating platforms and frameworks for providing guidance and how we collectively provide solutions to the challenges we face in the 
climate change space. Kahir works for Boston Consulting Groups and he is a managing director and partner at BCG. He has provided us with leadership across the public sector and the private sector. And he has also provided opportunities for us to advance our SDGs and enhance institutional, and institutional efficiency and effectiveness and agility across our different sectors and platforms. So I'd like to hand it over to Kahir for framing today's discussion. And again, I thank Kahir and his team for producing the work that he has for the last couple years in collaboration with our different programs and look forward to your presentation and to the panelists who follow um, Kahir's presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very excited about this conversation with all of you. Um, today and uh, to share some thoughts from from myself and BCG, uh, we have some slides to uh, to share, which I'll project right now. Um, hopefully, everyone can see them. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today, um, at, before we get into the panel discussion, um, and thank you very much for organizing this panel discussion, um, is to share um, a couple of thoughts on how on on um, the discussion and to frame it. And what we wanted to do is outline some of the multiple impacts of climate change on the food systems. Of course, everybody in this call has a good sense of that, um, but to just uh, hone in on a couple, uh, share a framework that we've developed that um, with USAID, um, but also with support from the African Development Bank with uh, for, from, um, from support from the uh, FCDO and others, uh, that helps to decision makers prioritize investments. And then I wanna illustrate that approach using the case study of Nigeria. So we go uh, from the conceptual to the real. So speaking about um, you know, the negative impacts of, um, of climate change, it's, and we're looking at the food value chain here. And what we've done is we've mapped the food value chain uh, from farmer inputs all the way to consumption and look at where are the impacts um, of climate change on that food value chain, right? And they're happening in two ways, right? So one is the climate risks, right? So resulting in food loss and waste. So you see, for example, um, you know, spoilage um, and growth during heat waves. Um, and then you look also at uh, other non-climate related risks to the food value chain, um, you know, from pest uh, outbreak and disease outbreaks to lack of cold, ch cold chain supply. But across the value chain, um, the climate impact and non-climate impact risks uh, are present, and they're not just central to food and agriculture, but they have an impact on energy, on water, on, um, on health, on infrastructure and cities, um, and on nature and bi biodiversity. So that multiple impacts leads us to a question of what are the solutions that um, we need to use to address um, these issues, both to reduce emissions, but also, and more importantly, perhaps to build resilience and adaptation. And so we worked to look at all options and solutions out there um, and to scan uh, different solutions across these sectors. And um, working with CASI, the Comprehensive Action on Climate Change Initiative, uh, we identified 115 different adaptation and resilience solutions that have been defined across these sectors. And to give you some illustration of that, in food and agriculture, it's everything from um, you know, efficient storage and, and processing infrastructure. Um, in water, it's the promotion of drip irrigation um, and other efficient irrigation methods. Um, in infrastructure, it's modifying road and railway networks. And so it's looking at all of these options uh, and solutions out there that are present that have been applied in different contexts. The question then comes up is, well, with so many options um, and so many solutions for different problems, where do you start? What do you do? Um, and how do you take an analytical approach that gets you the right priorities to make the right investments? And then how do you take those investments and finance them? So what we did, um, and this is the framework that we developed with USA, with FCDO, with the African Development Bank, and with, with some, some of the governments that we support, um, is we built this framework that has five steps to it. Um, and these steps take us through, um, one, starting with a progress stock take. So we don't want to start by reinventing the wheel. We want to start by seeing what's already out there. So we looked at everything that's been done in the country or in the region um, in question from the World Bank, from USAID, from the Regional Development Bank, from the UN, from other partners, um, and from the government itself, and say, this is where the current progress is. This is where the current... Um, 
context and situation is in the given uh, country when it comes to climate change. Um, and of course, the, the national adaptation plans and the NDCs are, are part of that. Then, and, and we've done this in many places, and we found that one of the key things that's missing um, often is the, the use of heavy and um, you know, high levels of data analytics uh, to measure the granular uh, climate risks. And so what we did is we developed uh, models and an approach to go down to a 500 square uh, meter granularity to look at the climate impact drivers at that level. And so once you have that, you actually can see that these are the challenges that we're facing in this particular locality. Um, and uh, these are the impact drivers that are driving, that are gonna have an impact in this locality. And that allows you to say, well, we know now where the challenges are, so let's create a portfolio, that's step three, of projects um, and investments that are uh, required to uh, mitigate, to, um, uh, to build adaptation and to build resilience for those uh, impact drivers. And that results in a long list, but then you require a bit of prioritization and that prioritization happens on, in terms of impact and, and feasibility. Um, and then you go into a process in step four and five around resource mobilization. So figuring out who should provide the funding for those uh, projects, whether it should be public or private or blended. Um, and then um, the implementation and monitoring coming forward uh, after that to make sure that those investments actually take through to the, to the end. So with that, um, I'd like to dive into one example um, we have in Nigeria. Um, so in Nigeria, this is looking at steps two and three because we, we don't need a, st a stock take, but looking at, that, looking at that granular risk assessment at the country level using deep data and analytics, and then two, the private capital mobilization and thinking about what are the attractive projects and how do you actually um, uh, prioritize them. So to start with that uh, climate impact drivers. So we know Nigeria is exposed to several climate impact drivers, uh, drought, chronic heat, fire, sea level rise and flooding. Uh, these are the main ones, of course, there are others. And so taking each of these, how do we go through a process of assessing um, what the impact is across the country? So now again, go, going back to that level of granularity of uh, 500 square meters, um, we looked at the climate risk intensity the economic impacts, the social impacts, um, and developed a vulnerability index based off of these. So when I take when I talk about economic impacts, I'm talking about um, job loss. I'm talking about um, roads getting um, you know inundated if it's uh, through flooding or other economic assets having um, uh, being impacted, energy assets being impacted. And when I'm talking about social impacts, I'm talking about things like um, Patients, the number of patients that are not going to have access to um, to health facilities because those health facilities are not operational in a, in an emergency or not operational will not be operational due to um, climate impacts uh, like sea level like sea level rise flooding. Um, looking at schools, how many students and what is the impact of students not being in school because their school facilities are not available or no, are, are uh, impacted by climate change. So taking all of that together over a multi year. Um, period developing this um, vulnerability index. And so you see it here, you know, drought, of course, no, no surprise in the north. It's very intensive uh, in North Nigeria, chronic heat, fire, sea level rise at, at, the, at the coast, and of course, flooding, which is a, a uh, across the country. So that gives you, and, and our, we have the ability to then d dive in at the very, you know, at the very granular level and zoom into specific localities and see the impacts there. Taking that um, as a starting point, right, and thinking, well, what what is what is going to happen um, here, and what is the cost of inaction, which is a, a new, which is an approach that we've we've taken to say, you know, if we do nothing, what is the value at risk? What happens? What is the the, the dollars that are potentially lost? And in just transportation and social infrastructure, you see that the cost of inaction can be massive, right? One hundred and forty billion um, on these types of infrastructure. So, for example. Um, railways where you know exactly where the rail tracks are, what will happen, um, and how will they impact, the, the impact is between 3 billion and 6.5 billion, right? Um, on human settlements, knowing where people live um, and knowing what, what, what the impacts are going to be on those settlements, where you might have to resettle people, you might have to rebuild housing, you might have to rebuild infrastructure around, um, around settlement, that impact could reach between 108 to 132 billion. And it's the same thing when you look at health facilities. You can actually map out every single health facility and then say, well, 
these are the impact drivers that are going to impact those health facilities and therefore the impact um, on number of patients and on cost will be the following and it's a bit harder because the coverage you know is not that data is not as good but it can give a really good sense of what's going on so with this sense of cost of inaction you then need to say well okay well we probably don't need 150 billion dollars to make investments because that's the cost of doing nothing. So the cost of doing something is much less. And we, we found in different examples that you know the cost of action is almost a quarter or 20% of what the of the loss of the potential losses would be in different contexts, right? So what we did is um developed a framework to uh, assess each project that might happen at each of the elements which is impacted, right? And to assess that those projects, we looked at two big criteria. One criteria is the financial return, right? Is it actually a bankable project? Is it a project that the private sector may take up or is it a project that the, the public sector will have to take up, okay? And then the second um, dimension we looked at is the adaptation impact assessment. Like what is the benefit, uh, the, the, the potential positive impact this investment would have on um, addressing the climate risks? And so when you put those two together, and in Nigeria, we found over 40 projects um, that we assessed, and you put those two, um, those two dimensions together. So going on the y-axis, the adaptation impact, so high impact at the top and lower impact uh, towards the bottom, and the level of financial attractiveness on the, on the x-axis, so no financial return um, you know, towards the left and high uh, financial return or market, at least market returns on, on the right. And you can start to plot different projects. And we looked at projects that exist or that have been discussed um, across the different partners. And we looked at projects that need to happen that haven't um, haven't actually got a project sponsor behind them, but it's clear that this is a project that will need to happen. And so you're able to look, you're able to map them out and say, well, there are some that have really good market returns. You know, um, waste to energy, for example, will have a market return and has some impact. But then on the, on the flip side, there are some projects that have high impact, like you see number 32 there, which is you know the, the surveillance systems, right? Surveillance systems the private sector may not be open to investing into, but are critical um, to get everybody aligned um, and to get um, uh, um, the investments moving forward. So with that, we then take um, a, a pro an approach of assessing who should invest in, in which opportunities. And each project you can triage. And so we've gone through a process of triaging all the projects and saying that there are some that have commercial opportunities that the private sector can absolutely pick up and they have financial returns. And we have we're gonna have some of our colleagues on this uh, panel talk about uh, those commercial opportunities that they've seen. And then there are public projects that are absolutely necessary um, that have huge impact but um, there is no um, capital, commercial capital available, and therefore we need to think about um, grant funding. We need to think about uh, using uh, government-owned resources or philanthropic resources to be able to address those um, those issues. And then in the middle, we have blended finance opportunities. So projects that, with uh, a different financial structure in the project financing, can become commercially viable or can become, um, you know, freestanding um, opportunities. And these are ones where there's a lot of discussion across, um, you know, organizations like the U.S. Development Finance Corporation or the IFC or others, um, and including in, with US, USAID's own um, um, uh, uh, finance accelerator, ways in which you bring in catalytic capital um, to, to bring the level of uh, investment required or the, the risk levels low enough so that the private and commercial uh, partners can come in and fund the project. So that lays out the framework for how uh, we prioritize and push different projects across um, the, the framework. So I wanted to leave you with that. Um, and hopefully this sets us up for a good conversation with our really um, awesome group of panelists. Um, and again, I wanted to thank um, Emily and um, Agri, uh, the AgriLinks team for organizing this webinar and for having us um, share some of our thinking on it. Thanks very much, everyone. I think I'll turn over to Julius now uh, to take us into the panel. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Kahir, for the framework. Um, and thank you, Emily, for the opening remarks. Um, my name is Julius Freitras. Uh, I'm going to be moderating our panel of experts today. Uh, I'm the coordinator of USAID's Sustainable Food Systems Working Group, and I'm also in, an institutional support contractor with Vistant, supporting the agency's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance as a water and natural resources management advisor. 
Uh, I work with the Infrastructure, Natural, and Water Resources Management team, which provides technical expertise and thought leadership on physical infrastructure design and implementation, protection and improvement of land, soil, and biodiversity, and water management for sustainable use in humanitarian programming. But uh, I'm not the attraction here. <laughs> That'd be our three panelists. Uh, we have three incredibly accomplished panelists with us here today, and I wanted to give a bit of an overview of their background. Uh, so first, Melissa Sequila is the Chief Vice President for Project Development and Finance at the Genesis Energy Group. Melissa is a dual qualified solicitor and business visionary who's not only served as local counsel to the African Export Import Bank to manage almost half a billion dollars of syndicated loan facilities into Southern Africa, but also led Genesis's expansion to over 500 megawatts of contracted capacity and nearly four gigawatts on the way. Second, we have Dr. Nalishebo Mabelo, uh, the Africa Lead for USAID's Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative. You might hear us refer to the activity uh, through, throughout this conversation by its initials, CASI. Uh, through her work with CASI, Dr. Mabelo supports countries in their efforts to design and update climate policies and implement adaptation plans. Over the past two decades, she has coordinated the implementation of several development initiatives focused on strengthening Africa's food systems at national, regional, and continental levels and we are very privileged to count on her guidance for today's discussion. Finally, uh, Dr. Samuel Ogala is the Senior Climate Change Advisor and Acting Head of the Climate Change Unit for the African Union Commission. Throughout his career, Dr. Ogala has excelled in areas such as strategy development and implementation, policy engagement, resource mobilization, administration, research, and program management. He has supported the National Adaptation Strategy and Plan of Action on Climate Change for Nigeria, the Kingdom of Eswatini's Nationally Determined Contribution Private Sector Engagement Strategy, and many, many more influential strategic assessments across the continent. Thank you all so much for making the time to be here with us today. One quick reminder for those of us in the room, if you have a question, please ask it via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll ask some of those towards the end of our discussion. So uh, to our Fantastic panelists. To kick us off today, I'd like to ask each of you to provide your reflections on the same question. Namely, in your professional experience, what are the primary ways we can collaborate across sectors and borders to invest in sustainable food systems? I'll pass it over first to Dr. Mabelo. Thank you, Julius. Um, thanks to yourself. Um, for uh, inviting me to be part of this um, panel. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to be able to, to respond to that first question. <laughs> so I'll begin by saying um, Africa's commitment to transform its food systems is articulated in, in several frameworks of the African Union, including Agenda 2063 uh, and its associated policy frameworks or flagship programs, which include the Comprehensive um, Africa Agriculture Development Program and the African Union's 2014 Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation for Shared Prosperity and Improved Livelihoods. Now, these um, frameworks um, provide uh, for tackling intrinsic challenges in Africa's food system, and they encourage the need to develop multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary food systems approaches at national level, approaches that have well delineated roles for the sector. Uh, these could include areas such as financing, input supply, production, processing, value addition, et cetera, the list is long. In terms of regional integration, which is uh, the cross-border aspect of your question, um, regional integration through cross-border trade and investment is crucial to supporting the food system. This is seen in some of the frameworks that have been developed through some of the regional economic communities, which are building blocks of the African Union, as we know. But also recently, we've heard about the launch of the African continental free trade area. Um, so across borders, we need to promote intra-regional trade based on uh, comparative advantage, comparative advantage from one country to another, we need to strengthen implementation of frameworks, frameworks of existing bilateral, tripartite, regional and continental trade agreements. And then both domestic and regional trade will help boost productivity and production, because of course the demand will be enhanced. We need, they will, it will enhance competition while also stabilizing prices and commodity supply. 
all the above, um, Julius, need to emphasize and be implemented with an environmental sustainability lens at play. In addition, we need to bring in the issue of gender equality, social inclusion. This must be pronounced uh, in these frameworks um, because it adds value to um, the food system. We need to look at issues such as strengthening education and awareness, strengthening policy support, which is something that CASI uh, is doing at the moment in supporting countries with uh, providing policy support uh, to, to these countries to develop relevant instruments. Uh, we need to provide, provide incentives for sustainable choices. For example, incentives uh, to those who buy locally grown foods or those who make eco-friendly choices, buyers of organic foods, etc. We need to look at improving food environments, supporting local and seasonal foods, and reducing food waste and loss, which I heard Kahir talk about earlier on, implementing strategies to minimize food loss, waste and loss at all stages of the food supply chain uh, and continue to collaborate across sectors. There's a need also to promote sustainable diets um, and practices through multi-stakeholder forums that uh, facilitate working together of governments, non-governments, businesses, and communities. So I'll end there um, in response to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Already a lot that we can follow up on and, and subsequent questions. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ogala next. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Julius, and uh, thank you everyone on this uh, call. Thanks also to USID for inviting me and also uh, the African Union Commission uh, to give their perspectives on the discussions of uh, sustainable food systems, especially on the continent. Uh, for me to respond to the questions you raised, uh, you're asking what are the ways we can collaborate uh, on this aspect of sustainable food systems. Uh, I would say the, uh, uh, two things that need to happen in terms of collaboration, and those are in the aspect of partnership, which is very key. And that partnership has to be structured. And once we have the partnership in place, we can collaborate across board. And what should the partnership uh, give us? We're looking at two strategic things from such partnership that will enhance collaboration across sectors and across borders. One, a partnership in terms of policy, relevant policy enactment and implementation. Second is in the aspect of uh, programmatic approach to how we need to move this partnership forward. So in terms of relevant policy, uh, we can collaborate and the African Union uh, uh, Union has put several policies in place to enhance sustainable uh, food system. Some of those which uh, Dr. Nalishebo had mentioned, we have the CADEF, which is an outcome of a policy or a decision from the African Union. That is the Comprehensive uh, Africa Agriculture Development Program. Uh, that is an, an offshoot of uh, relevant policies. We also have different policies that relate to the strategy uh, implementation and decisions that have helped the African Union member states to stabilize their food system uh, production and how we need to approach it. Uh, some of those things include the, 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 the CADEP. We have also the climate change strategy, which is there, is guiding, and there are components uh, of uh, the strategy that deals with agriculture and sustainable food uh, production. We've also uh, looked at issues of framework that are also currently in place. And I I'm going to go into detail of that shortly. What are the enabling uh, policy frameworks that we have on the continent that is enhancing a sustainable uh, food system and production on the continent? What are the strategies? I will look into that. So in the aspect of partnership, we need to collaborate with relevant partners whether they are private sector, whether they are uh, non-governmental uh, organizations, or whether they are government institutions, uh, we need we are exploring. And what we have done over the years at the African Union Commission is to explore partnership through uh, this front that we have, both the member states and the non-member states, to develop relevant policies that will address the issue of sustainable food system on the continent. The second aspect is also in the programmatic uh, approach. 
which deals with that partnership. We've worked with several institutions, and I'm going to uh, like World Bank and uh, uh, EU and uh, also uh, USID that we are currently also co uh, working with to bring put in the relevant policies that will address the issues of food, sustainable food system on the continent. And then we implement with our member states at some of these because they are now backed with existing policies or decisions of the African Union, then it becomes easy to implement. And because all the member states have signed on to such decisions and policies, then the program comes and it rolls. And I'm going to talk more about some of these programs that we're currently implementing uh, at the African Union in collaboration with our member states, all aiming at addressing issues of food and nutrition insecurity on the continent, issues of addressing hunger on the continent, and issues of addressing uh, reducing poverty and uh, increased income for our people. So in terms of collaboration, we can do that across sector and border through partnership. And in that partnership, we look at the aspect of policy development or policy enhancement or policy review that can sustain uh, our food system on the continent in the changing climate. And the second aspect is the programmatic approach that we can do in terms of how do we enhance and also ensure that our people remain food secure and nutrition secure on the continent. So these are the ways I think we, we're working currently at the African Union Commission to enhance sustainable food system across the continent. Thank you. Back to you, Julio. Thank you, Sun. Um, and finally, but absolutely not least, uh, Melissa, would love your reflections. Thank you, Julius, Dr. Weeks, and the entire team for organizing this really spectacular and timely webinar. Um, the beauty about coming in last is your colleagues have summarized everything well. But if I would provide my unique perspective to this, and particularly being a private player, I think fundamentally it's important that everyone understands, realizes, and accepts that for us to create sustainable food systems requires a significant amount of investments. Investment from private sector, investment from government, investment from DFIs, whatever the case may be it requires quite a bit of investment into the African continent to ensure that we are creating sustainable food systems. And by doing that, I think fundamentally what's important, and I believe um, my colleagues have mentioned it, what's fundamentally important is to ensure that we are creating an enabling environment that does allow participation from various sectors, from various um, countries to participate in these food systems. And with that background, I think I would summarize my input from um, a macro level and a micro level. I think on the macro level, Dr. Shibo, Dr. Sam, even Kahir mentioned just frameworks that have been put in place at an African continental level. And I think my urge is it is utterly important that each country that has signed on to these frameworks ratifies these policies and creates and implements local policies that do allow the market to open up. For example, Southern Africa is a leader in maize production in beef and in citrus fruits, while you see Central Africa is on tropical fruits and Western Africa is more your cassavas, your, your, your starchy based. Now, if all of these trading blocks could come together and create an environment where we are able to produce, preserve, and transport, we'll be able to operate in one of the most efficient um, systems that allows us to leverage on our different expertise per country. That's from a macro level. From a micro level, I think it's also very important that we, we bring the discussion a bit lower. I think the discussion to, to now has been very macro around policy, around framework, around governments, but I think real sustainability starts at the ground. And by that, what do I mean? Uh, the beautiful work that BCG does, the impactful work that Cassie does, just coming down to grassroots. How are we training the local women or the local men who are small to medium scale farmers on better ways to farm? So sustainable ways. I think Kahir mentioned drip irrigation and any other innovative solutions. Um, how are we creating as private sector from an energy perspective, how are we placing in energy systems that allow this food to be preserved 
uh, wants and to reduce post-harvest losses. And ultimately, how are we allowing for this food to be transported? And again, like I, I think education is very important, but also equipping um, grassroots levels with the tools, the information, and most importantly, the funding that's required for them to build a sustainable um, solution. And I think if we look at that from a ground, from an up, down, and down up perspective, we'll be able to ultimately meet in the middle to ensure that we are creating sustainable solutions. Incredible. Um, thank you for contextualizing the conversation in terms of the macro and micro level. And I think that the first question I want to follow up with actually uh, launches quite well off of that point. So as I mentioned earlier, I work for the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, which means um, that the focus of much of our team's work is on the most underserved populations. Um, so the scale of food insecurity today is almost unprecedented with 735 million chronically undernourished people in the world. Um, and when we're tackling such a large problem, how do we ensure that we lift up the poorest and most underserved populations with our investments into food system strengthening? In particular, thinking about the framework that Kahir gave us on um, the, the difference between what we think of as public impact projects uh, with high public good, but very low bankability, and then the other side of the spectrum with the blended finance and commercial opportunities that have these traditionally higher market returns, but um, are, are and can have very high public public impact. Um, so with regards to tackling the problem of strengthening food systems for the most underserved populations on the African continent, how do we, how should we think about that spectrum from market uh, rate low to market rate high, given that the public impact is so high? And this can be for any of the three panelists. Just jump in when you have a when you have a thought. <laughs> okay, so so let me jump in, um, Julius, and thank you for 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 that question. Um, yeah, I suppose this question could be answered from various angles. Um, so, in line with um, the United Nations Global Sustainable Development Goal Number Ten, which is aimed at promoting gender equality. Um, and others, uh, we need to identify from our populations some of the vulnerable groups that would need social protection. Uh, and also to be careful that, uh, you know, we don't lump everybody under that one category of social protection, that we also identify those that can be uplifted through production support and market linkages. So these are three different groups, social protection, those who are uplifted through uh, production support and then those who would be supported through market link linkages. Um, we need to prevent, manage and overcome situations that adversely affect these people, their well-being and um, the quality of their life. So, of course, we know what social protection is, um, but it requires that governments have good policies and programs that would be designed to reduce poverty and vulnerability. Uh, by promoting efficient labor markets, diminishing people's exposure to risks and enhancing their capacity to manage economic and social risks. Um, there is a conversation in the continent, in the African continent, about input subsidies, you know, whether these are good or not. So we need to rationalize input subsidies towards the vulnerable, but um, viable groups. Uh, this can potentially be good. However, we need to ensure that subsidies do not crowd out the private sector. I'm sure Melissa will agree with me, uh, being from the private sector. Uh, we also need to ensure that subsidies don't crowd out our SMEs, the small, medium enterprises, um, because we know that um, agro-based SMEs uh, and even large-scale um, enterprises are known to be creators of employment for vulnerable groups such as women and youth um, in the global south. So we need to focus on some of those issues. And then we also need to strengthen our community-based approaches, um, our financial support and the incentives um, that come with that. Um, there is a huge demand for capacity building and education. Um, and of course, we need to continue to strengthen our policies around um, this issue. 
um, and as well as advocacy. So there is an, a need for us to strengthen NGOs, non-governmental organizations that spend time advocating uh, for these marginalized um, groups. And then, of course, in the context of um, um, uh, cross-sector collaboration, we need to ensure that we uh, sectors are all working together for the common public good of ensuring that um, uh, uh, these groups, the marginalized groups, receive the support that they require. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mabello. Um, I would love to hear from Samuel in particular, because we may lose him to another meeting that he is coordinating for the African Union. Um, Samuel, do you have any reflections on this? Uh, uh, thank you, Julius. Uh, in terms of uh, subsidy, I think uh, what we need to look at uh, is the aspect who is also assessing uh, the, who is the subsidy meant for and who benefits from the subsidy. Uh, you will know that uh, over 80% uh, of farming uh, system on the continent is done by smallholder farmers. And some of these smallholder farmers don't have collateral to even get to, to the bank or some of these uh, seed companies or fertilizer business to access them or even get uh, access to renewable and uh, energy efficient technologies that they can use uh, in enhancing their productivity and also uh, create jobs and lift uh, the young African population out of poverty. And now that 60%, over 60% of cultivable arable land globally is on the African continent. It then means that Africa can feed the world if we do agriculture in the right way and make our food uh, production sustainable. But for us, for the continent to feed the world and feed itself, a subsidy cannot totally be, uh, you know, be overlooked, uh, either by the government, especially, given that uh, majority of the smallholder farmers uh, have lack access to some of these incentives. So when we talk about subsidy, we need to look at it, who, who benefits more. And if the government provides sub -sub subsidy, it will, one, increase uh, productivity for this teaming population, hence, and also the agricultural output from the continent will also go up. And that will, in a way, also enhance the living condition of the African people and create jobs for this young one. So in terms of subsidy, we're, we're looking at, okay, is it in terms of um, uh, renewable energy or energy efficiency? Is it in terms of energy? Uh, do, do, do the government need to waive, uh, you know, tax waves on some of these things? Some of these farmers might want to go into irrigation farming. And in the climate changing climate, we would need to adopt a, a modern uh, digital technology in terms of irrigation. So the cost of uh, irrigation facilities, especially if we want to, to, to use uh, renewable energy sources, is high. So who, who, who comes in between? Because the private sector would not want to, to, to go into helping in subsidizing because agriculture is looked at a very risky area, which they don't want to put a lot of money there. Nobody wants to do business in a too risky environment. So the place of subsidy is key in terms of enhancing and strengthening our uh, food system. Also talk about quality seeds. Uh, the smallholder farmers, not all of them will be able to afford quality seeds that will withstand the changing climate. In such a way, a subsidy comes in handy to increase productivity. And also in terms of uh, even uh, organic, inorganic uh, uh, fertilizer as well, that aspect also, we need subsidy. When you go across, uh, I see the presentation earlier, Nigeria to Southern Africa, and the Horn of Africa that is uh, going through drought and, and all those things. So what do we do in the face of drought? Then we have to uh, maybe involve the, in the technology of rainwater harvesting when it comes. Those equipment that are required might be beyond the, the purchasing power of the smallholder farmers who is within Africa and the young population shared by the subsidy comes in. So I think it's uh, a, a situation of giving it a balance um, that, okay, the private sector needs to maximize profit, but also the majority of the farmers, the smallholder farmers on the continent, who are now being uh, saddled with the responsibility of servicing the climate uh, impact across the continent, will actually need to be subsidized for them to enhance productivity, reduce poverty and hunger, and create jobs for the teaming population. And then in such a way, Africa can feed itself and also feed the world, having 
over 60% of the global uncultivated arable land. I can make it. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, I wish we had three hours uh, to discuss all the different components of that answer because it was really comprehensive and had a lot of a lot of really interesting components. I want to follow up on one component of it and direct it to Melissa, um, specifically on investments into renewable energy. Uh, it, it would be great to to right size subsidies uh, insofar as these would benefit uh, the most underserved populations, but renewable energy, as we will hopefully about to hear, is something that uh, is incredibly market competitive across Africa. Um, and I would love to get Melissa's perspective on how um, energy plays into food security in this in this way at the, the juncture of the public good and the potential for market investment. Um, so over to you, Melissa. Oh, thanks, Julius. And I think that's such a pertinent question. And the short answer would be um, arguably, I think energy plays one of the most critical roles in in, in uh, food production, uh, and it's simple. So, for example, um, as uh, Dr. Sam mentioned, the bulk majority of farmers in Africa are small-scale farmers in rural areas. Now, one of the fundament one of the other fundamental aspects of agriculture is water supply. Now, with the ongoing drought, which we anticipate will continue to prevail in the next couple of years, we need to be considering alternative ways to, to water our, our crops or to provide water and sanitation to, to our agricultural practices. Now, one of the things we're doing as Genesis is uh, solar drip irrigation. And again, that's two-pronged, that's solar plus um, energy. Now, a lot of these small scale farmers, and if I just tie back to how do we alleviate the poorest uh, in food production and what energy role has to play. In all of these small scale farmers, even as private sector, we will not be able to provide renewable energy solutions uh, for free. And while there are subsidies, subsidies, there'll still be a commercial as farmers. Now, a single farmer would not be able to afford a solution like that. But if we come and we aggregate farmers within particular regions, for example, if you take the um, Buluwayo region of, let's say, Zimbabwe, and you aggregate small-scale farmers or rural farmers within that area, and you form a quasi-mini-grid on irrigation, but also on power. You will then see that these small scale farmers are having an aggregated buying power and the ability to actually pay off these solutions over and above the subsidization. Um, I think that's one element. The other element uh, around the role energy plays in agriculture, now at a very macro level, the post harvest losses that Africa faces today are astronomical. Nigeria has one of the biggest post harvest losses from dairy farming as well as tomatoes. Zimbabwe has post-harvest losses in, in, in um, inability to process maize uh, in, in a good time. And all of this can be alleviated by putting in solar powered or renewable energy powered cold storage systems that will allow us to preserve these products. And again, I keep battering on and also transport these because you'll see any given region will have excess production that they wouldn't use utilize in that specific region. It is important that we create an enabling environment that where we can transport food and trade food to allow for more sustainable um, agriculture. And I believe what some of these um, elements will see an uh, increase in production, but also in preservation of food across the continent. Fantastic. Um, your audio did break up a tiny bit um, in there. So uh, going forward, perhaps we would it be OK to ask you to keep your camera off for um, clarity of signal? But we did catch that whole answer um, and it was really helpful. Um, so actually, I'm going to follow up to that question on the long term. So the, the longevity, durability and sustainability of many of these collective investments. Um, so lots has been lots has been said about the 
the durability, sustainability of investments in humanitarian and um, agricultural development uh, programs. Um, and I was hoping to ask uh, Dr. Mabelo to reflect on the value of localization and what the sort of missing gaps in investing in local capacity are to ensure that uh, climate finance is going as far as it can in supporting communities to, to maintain the infrastructure, the structures, the governance systems that they invest in for their food security. Thank you, uh, Julius, uh, for that question. So uh, could you just repeat the question again, sorry? Yes, absolutely. Um, so essentially, I'm, I'm hoping to get some insights from you on localization, mm -hmm. How what mm -hmm. we should be looking into in terms of supporting through policy, supporting through investments, in mm -hmm. supporting the capacity of local organizations and communities to invest themselves in food security and to sustain investments in food security. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, so earlier on, um, Kahir mentioned the um, project um, that I am working on, USAID's Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative, which has a huge focus on localization, on working with local institutions to ensure that um, country NDCs and NAPs um, are advanced um, in, in terms of their implementation. And so working with um, um, local institutions, for instance, I'll give an example in Zambia. Uh, Zambia uh, was supported by an institution called the Indaba Agriculture Policy Research Institute uh, to help the country strengthen its implementation of the NDC and the NAP. And one of the areas that they were looking at was supporting countries develop uh, policy instruments um, and strategies that would help to deliver on certain thematic areas, including uh, the area of finance. So in Zambia, one of the instruments that has recently been launched is the um, green growth strategy. Uh, and the idea of the green growth strategy, of course, is to help um, advance um, private sector investment, uh, climate finance into uh, green uh, projects. Um, another area that um, has been looked at uh, within the context of um, enhancing uh, climate finance um, uh, and access by um, the communities is the area of um, supporting the development of, of projects, bankable projects. Um, so obviously bankable projects in order to uh, advance um, finance. So in my case, I believe that governments should provide a predictable policy and regulatory environment that provides and also expedites private sector investments that would then supplement public donor and other financing while creating uh, in employment. Another instrument that the government is working on at the moment is a legislative framework to promote green financing. Uh, and an example is um, uh, of, of some of those uh, products would be green bonds. Uh, and some of you may be aware that um, uh, a company called the Copper Belt Energy Corporation in Zambia actually floated some green bonds um, up to about $200 million worth. So this is with a view, obviously, to attract private investment um, uh, and ensure climate finance is flowing um, in the country. Um, so I think I'll end there, um, but also importantly, because you talked about localization, it is very important that we use local institutions to strengthen data, analytics, reporting, and learning within the context of the food system. Um, countries should cannot develop policies willy-nilly. They need the support of local institutions to support um, data and analytics to uh, inform some of those um, instruments that are relevant uh, for enhancing climate finance um, in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are coming 
rapidly to the close of our uh, fireside chat component of the panel, mm -hmm. um, where we will then transition into the public Q&A. But before we do that, I just wanted to leave everyone with the opportunity through a final question to reflect on the biggest barriers still remaining to sustainable, resilient food systems. Um, so we have talked about some of these, but I wanted to give the opportunity to just reflect on that a bit more explicitly. And first, because I saw he was already on the move uh, and want to give him the opportunity to respond, um, Samuel. Thank you, uh, uh, Julius. I, I think uh, basically uh, we, we have uh, a lot of uh, opportunities and, and areas uh, which we can, uh, we can we can explore in terms of this discussion, and and like I said, I would still like to go back to uh, what we are currently doing at the African Union Commission uh, to to address this issue. Uh, one of the things that we recently had is the ten year African Fertilizer and Soil Health Action Plan which is meant to accelerate the inclusive agricultural growth, transformation of agriculture sector, and alleviate hunger on the continent. Uh, for those who are also familiar with the, with the uh, Abuja Declaration, the Abuja Declarations, which all the member states signed up to, is to increase agricultural productivity by increasing the, the volume and, uh, of fertilizer application uh, by 10%. And uh, that declaration is binding on all the, the member states and they are enforcing it. Then we have the Af Technology for Africa Agriculture Transformation Tax, which is an initiative of the African Development Bank. And that contributes to the Feed Africa strategy. Uh, it's meant to lift 40 million out of poverty by 2025 and increase crude productivity. Uh, beyond uh, uh, over 40 percent but over and above we have the cadet which i talked about earlier and uh, the malabo declaration so these strategies are there to enhance the whole process above all on top of that in the changing climate is the african union climate change and resilient development strategy and action plan 2022 to 2032 which is one of the strategy that the USID Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative is supporting the African Union in its implementation. In the context of changing climate, the climate change strategy is also focused, in fact, there is a dedication, uh, dedicated intervention axis on food security, sustainable food systems for the continent. And this is the overarching climate change strategy that is governing the whole continent on this. Now, it also emphasizes the aspect of the climate smart agriculture, which is uh, increasing agricultural productivity on the African continent sustainably. Why not, uh, why reducing the greenhouse gas emission and also contributing to national development? And I think that is also the aspect where the CASI project that uh, Nali Shebo talks about, and uh, the, which is supported by USAID, is also coming in uh, strongly. So these are various instruments as far as uh, the African Union is concerned, just to mention but a few that uh, are currently in place to address some of the questions uh, were being raised. So when you take this uh, document and these policies and strategies, which actually draw their existence from the Africa Agenda 2063, you will see that we, the African Union continent is focused on making the current 220 million Africans who are under uh, chronic undernutrition uh, and also uh, the majority of our farmers who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture, which is climate sensitive and is no longer reliable. Uh, to, to move ahead uh, in terms of addressing sustainable food system and the questions you answer them. So what we need to do and take forward is effective implementation of these strategies, and it will help us to address most of the questions we are talking about. The strategy as well as the policy also talks about even a subsidy, it talks about uh, renewable energy, it talks about introduction of technology 
to help uh, African agriculture and sustainable food systems. So these are some of the things that if we implement them, and uh, especially along with our member states, uh, we change the narration about sustainable food system on the continent. And this is where we also welcome, I talked about the issue of partnership. The private sector are key in the delivery of this because the government instrument, the African Union instrument alone cannot do it. The resources are not there. But the partnership with the private sector, an institution that, like USID and other like-minded, will help us in effective implementation and responding to most of the questions uh, we've been uh, asked here. Uh, let me stop here and I submit uh, Julius. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, many gaps, but good reminder that there are a lot of qualified, uh, excellent people working on these gaps as well. Um, over to Melissa for the same question. Thank you, Julius. And uh, if you allow me, I just want to switch on my video to ensure that I'm audible. I think I will summarize it to three things. And um, I run the risk of perhaps potentially being offensive here. But I think the, the first on my list is we spend a lot of time as a continent and as a sector setting up policies and frameworks and not enough time implementing these. Um, my colleagues here have mentioned these brilliant ideas and strategy documents that are there, that have been there for years, and we're doing far less than actual actionable um, actions to put that forward. I mean, you do have um, organizations such as CASI, um, Aim for Climate Change, Aim for CE. You do have pockets of action, but I think for, for the policymakers on this on this webinar, I think we now need to move and turn into action steps that will create real impact and change. The second thing is, I think the discussion always or is mostly a very macro discussion. I really believe that to tackle food security in Africa and sustainability, we need to break everything down to the grassroots levels right from the micro, the, the ladies in the villages, the small um, family in, in a rural area, uh, an orphan child who doesn't know what to do, but they've got a massive piece of land they've inherited from a family. How do we ensure that they can utilize the land to provide um, produce for their family, but also to provide them with a sustainable business to be able to, to feed others? And I think the last one, but not least, and particularly coming from me from the private sector, is investment. I think it is absolutely critical that one of the barriers is lack of access to agri-financing, lack of access to, and while there are bonds, and they're, they're fantastic bonds out there, all of the DFIs are green bonds. These green bonds are not accessible to your grassroots person. They're not even accessible to mid-scale farmers because of the bankability criteria. So we really need to look into microfinancing at a grassroots level to allow these smaller scale farmers and agricultural enterprises to scale. And at a macro level, at a higher level, we need to ensure that we create enabling environments that do allow the private sector to come in and make the investments. Because as we all know, private sector isn't, it's not charity, right? It has to make a business case. And therefore, there must be an enabling environment. I can come in and invest my money. My money is secure. There's business that's thriving. The rule of law stands. And therefore, I can um, have confidence in investing in it because infrastructure is absolutely critical for food sustainability. Thank you, Melissa. Your audio was perfectly clear and your points were perfectly clear. Um, and final reflections from uh, Dr. Mabelo. Um, thank you, Julius. Um, yeah, and thanks, Melissa, for, for your points. Um, and I just wanted to remind us um, on this webinar that um, not too long ago, not too long ago, Africa's momentum in terms of our food systems was act actually on a positive trajectory. We did have a positive trajectory not too long ago, about a decade ago, you know, you could see statistics that were showing that there was a positive trajectory in um, in Africa's uh, food systems development. Uh, but of course, we've had quite a number of, um, you know, crises that have led to us um, going backwards. So what is it that we can learn from that momentum? What were some of the things that we did right 
uh, during that momentum. So in terms of um, some of the barriers that I identify that are still remaining, um, uh, I think low agriculture production productivity, which my colleagues have talked about uh, in most of uh, our African countries due to factors such as uh, research and development and extension. And many of you are aware that um, very little funding is going into research development and extension in uh, African countries. I know that the um, target uh, by the heads of state and government of the African Union is that um, we should allocate at least 1% of agriculture GDP to research and development and extension. But when you look at the reports, you will realize that uh, there are very, very few countries that have actually um, achieved um, that 1% um, uh, of supporting R&D and development and extension in, in, in terms of allocation of budgets. Um, you may also be aware that very recently, um, the African Union had a meeting um, where heads of state and government made pronouncements on fertilizer use and generally issues around soil management. Now that also uh, is, a, is an issue um, you know, the, the lack of capacity, the lack of knowledge around fertilizer use and uh, soil health management um, is causing um, some, some issues around advancing uh, food, uh, resilient food systems. Uh, but with the 10-year um, uh, action plan that has been developed, uh, Melissa talked about implementation. Well, there is an action plan that has been developed around fertilizer use and um, soil health management. My hope is that... Um, countries in Africa will implement uh, the content. Of course, climate change and its effects will continue to be an issue around um, uh, resilient food systems, as well as lack of adaptive uh, capacity, uh, which will continue to pose a risk in our food systems. Um, colleagues also talked about resources scarcity and other economic financial barriers. I will not belabor that point. Um, Policy and governance issues will continue to be um, an issue for us if we do not strengthen our data analytics for me and, for, uh, and support in formulation and implementation of uh, our policies. And then uh, lastly, there are knowledge, serious knowledge gaps and technology gaps that uh, hinder progress in advancing uh, our food systems development. Julius, one other point that uh, I think hasn't come up in this conversation is around social and cultural issues and how those impact on uh, the food systems um, in Africa. So it's a conversation for, you know, for many hours, but definitely it's an issue that we should um, think about um, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... In classic webinar fashion, we have run into our public Q&A section. Um, so I would ask our panelists to be fairly snappy with our responses to the Q&As, just so we can try and get it through as many as possible. Um, but I'd also like to invite Kahir to join the Q&A portion of this. So actually, our first question relates to that last point you made, uh, Dr. Mabelo. So the very first question we have is, Thank you for highlighting the need for ensuring environmental lens while also balancing gender equality and social inclusion. Just wondering, how can we meaningfully and practically make food systems more inclusive and environmentally sustainable? Okay, I assume that question is uh, directed to, to me. <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> so there are various stakeholder groups that are uh, relevant to the food system. So you have your public sector, you have your, your donors, you have your, you know, all these people who make decisions, those who finance, but you also have the affected. Uh, and yesterday I was uh, privileged to uh, moderate a panel uh, that involved, um, that was talking about youth, the youth and their um, uh, participation in decision-making, uh, their participation in negotiation. So one of the things that I think we need to do is strengthen um, these stakeholder groups by building their capacity to be able to come to the table to negotiate or present their issues. Um, because it's very difficult to participate in a conversation when you don't have the soft skills 
to even put your, your points across. It is very difficult to participate in these conversations when your stakeholder group is not organized. Uh, and so I think we need to spend more time uh, building the capacity of stakeholder groups, marginalized groups to organize themselves, to be able to put across um, their issues so that they are also uh, considered in some of the decisions, in some of the policy making processes, um, et cetera. Melissa talked about green bonds and 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 who has access to green bonds, for instance, and that you know marginalized groups um, uh, such as women and youth may not even be uh, aware of how to uh, you know participate in in a market uh, that involves green bonds. So it's all about building capacity, providing knowledge, um, so that people are aware uh, before they can even you know, request for access to some of these um, uh, services that are available to them. Thank you. Thank you for the reflections. Um, actually, I'd like to direct the next question to Kahir. Um, so can you please provide some comments on what kinds of investments can be made for increased adaptation to strengthen food systems, especially when, within the African continent? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so we, we talked about a number of uh, potential investments um, in in the work that I um, that I've been looking at. So so um, the the first one, and I think this responds to some of the questions that that came up. Um, investments around data and data analytics are really really critical because without the right data, we're not able to get the the level of um, of granularity, the level of um, information that we need to to make the decisions right so that's 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 one broad bucket of investments that are required but i think um you know melissa talked about uh, the importance of energy and using uh, renewable energy across the agriculture food value chain is critical um so to create redundancies of, of the power network uh, or to create the power network as the case may be um energy storage to systems, um, you know, microgrid, natural gas generators, uh, which are strategically distributed in the right places um, if, as, as may be needed. Um, and then, you know, I talked when I spoke earlier about uh, specifically in the food value chain, efficient storage and processing infrastructure um, that would that would reduce uh, post-harvest lo harvest loss, um, extends the shelf life of perishable product produce. Um, Transitioning uh, to different uh, livestock and crop species. That's a, a much larger uh, um, transition that needs to happen because th there are different species that are more suited to different expected climate impacts. So those are some of the areas that uh, investments could be made that could become uh, potentially uh, viable uh, from a commercial perspective. Thank you, Kahir. Also always worth keeping that bankability in mind. Um, in in which sense, uh, let me direct the next question to Melissa. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how different sectors are supporting technologies that reduce food loss uh, and other advancements for sustainable food systems? So I know we did talk a little bit about the energy sector, but would love to get your reflections on this and on how that and that bankability for the grassroots can really be made possible. Thank you, Julius. Apologies, I was trying to find my unmute button. Uh, button. I think naturally because Genesis is in the energy sector, so um, a lot of my experience or inputs really are from the energy sector, but we are seeing, and to their credit, we are seeing a lot more DFIs, financial institutions, really looking into how can they provide microfinancing um, and, uh, as Dr. Sheba said, capacity building to allow for these bankability measures to come into place. Now, I think it's important also to note that whether or not it is microfinancing or large scale financing, the, the matter of bankability is still there. Uh, and I think it's important to therefore, and we are also seeing, uh, like I said, uh, organizations such as Cassie, the works that Kahir is doing at BCG, really coming in from a data perspective and a climate adaptation perspective, coming in to support food security. I don't think the solution for food security is a um, is is a single approach. I think it's a multi pronged approach. I think it's a dimensional approach. And we're also seeing, um, as Dr. Sam and Dr. Shibo mentioned, we are, to their credit, seeing African governments really sitting down and taking note and taking um, 
active strategies around food security. So while, yes, there are some shortcomings that we need to come over, I am seeing, even from a, just an energy perspective, we are seeing a lot of intersectoral uh, collaboration coming in to ensure that we are meeting people at their point of need. Um, and I think that's my ultimately my response there, Julius. Thank you. And the next question follows up quite uh, fluidly to the aspect of the analytics of it. Um, and I'd like to direct this one to uh, Sam and or Shebo, um, whichever one of you wants to take over or, or is able to jump in. But it's specifically about measurement. How best should we support measurement um, to track progress towards the effectiveness of sustainable food system investments? Um, and towards the ability of sustainable food systems to help populations ad adapt to climate change. So again, the question is primarily on the measurement frameworks for this. Thank you, uh, Julius. I, I think uh, on the measurement, uh, what we have currently in, uh, in place at the African Union, we talk so much about the CADE, which is the Comprehensive uh, Agriculture, Africa Agriculture Development, there is what we call the biannual review, which uh, after every two, two years, we measure the member states comes together to assess themselves and also learn what is happening and they score themselves. And even awards are given to member states, those who are doing so well uh, on the CADEP implementation, that is uh, every two, two years. And that creates uh, a forum for other member states who are not doing so well on the radar to say, oh, what is, uh, for instance, Tanzania doing in achieving their food sustainability and agricultural productivity under the CADEP that uh, we need to do uh, maybe in, uh, in, uh, in Nigeria or in Sierra Leone or in, in Morocco. So there is a measurement uh, thing that is in place uh, at the African Union. We call it the Biannual Review of CADEP. So that brings the member states to evaluate themselves on the progress that they have been made in the implementation of CADEP. The last one uh, uh, was done even this year uh, for member states, and the reports were reviewed. Again, under the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan, which uh, USID, through the Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative, CAS is supporting, uh, we're working towards with partners the african union is working towards developing what we call the monitoring learning and reporting dashboard where we're going to be measuring uh, the progress towards the implementation of the strategy and like i mentioned because agriculture is part of that strategy is part of the intervention area then it's going to be measured through the dashboard and uh, it will be reported again uh, to all the member states so at the African Union level, there are various uh, measurement mechanisms to enhance uh, accountability, to enhance peer learning, to enhance delivery, and the set targets. And this has been ongoing, especially under the, the CADEP uh, program. I, I, I submit. Thank you. Um, Julius, if I can just add on to um, that point. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. So these measurement frameworks that Sam has spoken about are as good as the data that feeds into them. So the data becomes an issue. Um, and countries, you know, many a time have talked about the challenges that we have in, in collecting data to feed into some of these tools. And so it will be very important for us to rethink um, how we resource data collection uh, in these countries, how we resource capacity building for collection of data, for analytics, etc. So it takes me back to what I talked about, the lack of um, investment in uh, the area of research, in the area of data collection, and uh, etc. So these are good um, uh, measurement tools, yes, but I think they still have um, a, a, a bit of a long way to go in terms of ensuring that you know the data that goes into them is uh, data that is sufficient and that those who collect it are well capacitated. Thank you. 
Thank you for that really important closing point. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. This is open to all panelists to answer and to Kahir. Um, and then I, I may have to uh, cut in partway through so that we can hand it over to our closing uh, speaker. Um, so the question is, are panelists seeing many opportunities for climate finance and investments to fund projects that may not have a clear return on investment? What do you see as the main barriers to scaling this up and to making it work for to benefit small scale farmers? Yeah, um, uh, let me come in, if I may come in, uh, Julius. I think uh, on the, the aspect of, um, uh, let's, let's just even turn to financing, like climate financing. Yeah, because uh, we, we look at two streams when it comes to that. Uh, the various financing, climate financing industry, architecture that we have, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, the Small um, uh, Special Climate Change Fund, and, and the rest of them. And now the loss and damage fund that have just been uh, operationalized at uh, COP2018 in Dubai. Every, uh, most of this uh, fund also deals uh, with supporting uh, agriculture and uh, adaptation. Uh, but again, uh, where we talk uh, about, we have uh, the challenges, like you mentioned, is um, uh, many of these funding uh, architectures and maybe funders or private sector see little return on investment when it comes to financing adaptation projects across uh, the country. And that is where we need to encourage now uh, the local, and I talked earlier, the internal resource mobilization, domestic internal resource mobilization and uh, by the national government and also making agriculture um, an, an agribusiness rather than, especially on the African continent, rather than looking at it as a subsistence way of living, we just want to survive. No, if we make agriculture uh, an agribusiness and people know that they can make money out of it, the young population in Africa sees uh, opportunities in agriculture, uh, then it, it will even be self-generating in, in financing. And then the resources that come from the various uh, climate finance architecture, some in the mitigation component, which can go towards the renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency equipment and input, then that can come in handy uh, in, in, in providing finance for this. And where we have in the uh, adaptation sector, where we also have adaptation fund, which uh, talks about agriculture as well. So these are various streams, but I think at the local level, we, there is a lot to be done to make agriculture uh, an agribusiness uh, from the way we view it, uh, and then see it as income generating and uh, drawing in the larger population of the continent that we have to, to actually uh, buy into this. And then it, it, it should uh, be uh, self-sustaining. And then in that way, we can at least leverage on the private sector investment to, to come in into this sector and we can get finances to the sector. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. Um, that was that was a very comprehensive answer. And in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it over to our closing uh, speaker. But I first wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of our panelists and Kahir for all of the excellent insights they've offered today. Um, thank you again. And uh, please, everyone, engage with these folks' work because they are leaders in our field. Um, so to close us off, I'm going to hand over to Jacqueline Musitwa. Um, who is a senior climate finance advisor at USAID and a thought leader independently on African business and geopol geopolitical issues. Um, Jacqueline, over to you. Thank you, Julius. And thank you to all the panelists for such an interesting conversation. Um, I wasn't able to tune into all of it, but from what I heard, I'm definitely inspired despite the number of challenges that were pointed out during the session. And also judging by the participation, there are obviously a lot of people who are interested in these topics. So I do hope that we can continue this conversation after today to try to find additional solutions within the space. I think just a few words um, with respect to some of the work that we're doing here at USAID, um, just to provide additional context. Um, from our perspective, I think one thing that came out of the conversation that you had that we're definitely trying to tackle is around localization. How can we better utilize skills, networks, indigenous knowledge, um, 
local financing structures in the countries where USAID is active and really working through the mechanisms we have to better support people on the ground um, is a top priority for USAID because we do understand the value that our partners have and why it's especially important for adaptation, uh, why it's important for food systems that unfortunately aren't always getting a majority of the financing um, and also um, political attention. Now, I, I think just also to highlight a couple of um, points that were raised earlier, um, it's obviously um, been said before that you know it's all we all have a role to play, and I think it's really important for us not only to point the finger at uh, lawmakers um, and others, but really trying to figure out where we sit, what we can do. I definitely applaud the leadership of the African Union for really getting member states to think harder, to think more about food systems and really food independence. Um, and one thing, though, that I would like to continue to urge member states is to think more creatively about how to create enabling environments, how to create more sustainable investment uh, environments so that investors can come in and find the value in long-term sustainable solutions um, within the agricultural space. Part of that is coming up with predictable policies, laws, and regulations, but part of it is making sure that there is coherence um, and investors are able to really find the opportunities um, there. In addition to effective policies, I think one big question is how can African countries better incentivize sustainable agricultural practices, uh, support innovation and drive systemic change? I think a lot of the panelists before mentioned the need for better data um, and mentioned the need for systemic approaches. But I think at the core of that is really how do we create more opportunities for employment? How do we create healthier populations? And how do we also promote wealth across the continent? Moving to the point of data, uh, not only as a tool, but also as a point of leverage, I think it's really important for us to continue to tap into African educational institutions, think tank, and really use them as sources of knowledge as well as direction in the space. Yes, there's a lot of data that uh, exists, but how do we continue to mine it, to map it, and make it? And there are companies um, such as Amadi and Kenya that are really working hard with respect to agricultural data and AI and trying to find solutions. So maybe just a source of encouragement to those working in the tech space is how can they continue to encourage to find your types of solutions to bring wider scale solutions for the agricultural space. Uh, within our team here, let's say, through the private finance program, well, to some great instance, um, and the adaptation window provided by the adaptive developments that needs to use the data to try and uh, flex across the world and to use that data for to help more So we too are trying to make the scene of the agriculture sector um, predictability and really trying to influence policy and use. I think another part um, that I'm going to just want to talk about for the audience uh, is that the private sector engagement is really once again a point of pressure of the private sector to be. Jacqueline, apologies. I don't mean to interrupt, but I, we're starting to lose your sound a little bit. Could you possibly uh, elevate your volume a tiny bit? Yes. You still hear me. Uh, it's still a little modulated, um, but we'll, we'll forge on and and hope to catch the the rest of the remarks. Apologies for the in, uh, the interruption. No problem. Um, I also realize this is better. Yes, a little bit. Okay, great. I also realize we are at times so that just want to highlight that it's really encouraging from what we are seeing is. Uh, we are starting to do this uh, change of 
um, foster interest to run Joe Harris as well as the impact investors uh, with respect to funded finance structures and really trying to solve the challenge of community grant funding and different capital steps to try and attract different investment and to partner to invest as in classes like heritage. And so through this working with the space is from the source of looking to partner with the presidency to learn the report about the finance and how to better fund um, such structures and how to demonstrate to the market that we do have solutions. I think the last is really um, just a a uh, as opening encouragement that has really consistent to the issues in the so we've seen a number of extreme funding that's around the continent and the link that moves out of the region. And because we can convert solutions to make sure that we aren't thinking of the immediate needs, but thinking about the medium and the term planning, how to reduce not only the COVID security, but also to use that as an opportunity to reduce pollution. Different parts of the world. We're currently dealing with the big civil engineer and looking forward to the opinion is not so far. So we really have to realize the tools we already have to start to play. And also just a call uh, for collaboration with the USA brothers passing the rules or CMDA are interested in being a part of the work that is all Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, apologies for the technical uh, interference. This recording will be available on YouTube after the fact, which means that if there was any part of that that you did not catch, you can uh, watch the video back, use closed captioning, um, and amp up the volume a tiny bit. Um, but as always, we are in, in awe of the insight of your comments, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. It has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, please tune in to the recording and please tune in to the rest of our Sustainable Food Systems theme month for the rest of August. We will be posting not just the recording of this webinar, but also reflections on other components of USAIDs and the extended USAID networks, um, Sustainable Food Systems programming, and hopes and aspirations. So please do tune in, um, engage with the theme month, and do not hesitate to reach out to any members of the team if you want to engage with us further. Thank you again.